Hi, Margaret. Hello, Joyce. How are this you, is a, I'm good, good, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm a little frazzled. There's a lot of uh, packing and moving and, in fact, let me turn my phone off. Um, yeah, dinging and carrying on over here, but we're good. I can only imagine. So for me, this is kind of a dream come true, a, a t twist of fate that I get to interview <laughs> you. It's a first for me, so I'm, I'm no, excited. I'm a little worried this. since you know everything. <laughs> Not everything. But it's interesting, I was out the last week and I was thinking a lot about what you might be thinking as you're counting down to your last show. Yeah. And reflecting on a career that spans almost four decades. What have you been thinking about? You know, this is, maybe something's wrong with me. I tend to be very now oriented. So the only times that I've really thought about, you know, well, what does it mean to end a career has been sending people clips or pictures or whatever that they needed for something and kind of thinking about that. But I'm pretty in the present and what the next thing is. And I'm looking very forward to this next chapter. I feel like I had a wonderful time in this business, met the smartest people, had amazing experiences, learned a lot. Um, I couldn't be more grateful, but it also feels like this is, this is the part where I go on to something else. It just feels that way. You probably are not one that's thought to yourself, oh, I wonder what my legacy is going to be, or <laughs> what will people remember about my work, or will they remember this story, or that I went to this place. But now that you're calling at least this part of your life a career, what is it that you want people to remember about just oh, the gosh. chance of work that you've done? I, I hope that somewhere along the way I did some good with the stories that I told or helped somebody. I hope that people will think I did that with integrity and good intent. Um, and that's, that's really the nub of it. I, I always thought that journalism was about making a difference in some way or another. And I don't mean by advocating a certain point of view, but by helping to shine a light on things that people were suffering through, things that were happening that, you know, were not just or were not right and ways we could do something about that. And then people make their own decisions, but I hope it, it will be remembered as something that came from um, a moral compass and integrity, I hope. When you talk about moral compass and integrity, I know as a journalist, it's our job to be objective. Primarily our job though, is to tell the truth and the blending of those two things, especially in recent times, have you found it challenging? I think it is because almost everything is politicized now and it's difficult to, um, you know, I don't know how objective anybody actually is, but we certainly try. And I think there's more of an effort and a, you know, a real, um, work ethic behind that in journalism than people realize. And so I think part of this has been we're just living through a time where the truth is a slippery thing for a lot of people. Disinformation is present. Um, we have fewer resources to go out and do the more extensive reporting that we'd like to do around certain things. And so we're living in an unreliable information world right now. And I hope that changes. I hope we can all work towards something better because we can have different ideas about how we might want to tackle things. But, you know, if there are X number of people living in poverty, or if there are certain injustices that can be tallied up through a look at our criminal justice system, for example, then that's a fact. And it's not the media stirring things up or certain people causing problems. It's a fact. And we have to deal with it. As you know, this week, we are remembering John Lewis, civil rights icon to this country. And when I was thinking about his moral compass, I was wondering today, the people that you may have interviewed, if you had a chance to ever interview him. As a I would have loved to. <laughs> I've, he has always been such a hero to me. And, and I, I think there was an unimaginable courage and conviction from him that started in his teenage years that, that just sort of boggles the mind. There are a few people I've met around the world, none of them famous really, but people who've done incredible work in the face of such difficulty. Um, there was a woman in particular in Burundi who had, had they had 
a slow rolling genocide next door to Rwanda. And it was the other way around in terms of, of victims and perpetrators. And she began taking in children and over the years has um, housed and educated something like 30,000 kids who were orphaned by, by the war and the genocide there. And you meet people who are so unassuming and loving and full of light that it's just a pleasure to be a human being with them, you know, just to imagine you somehow are in their sphere. And that's the best part of the job there. I mean, people are amazing. And I know we're, we're living through this time right now where there's a lot of um, ugliness, but people are amazing. Who else would be on that list of the many people that you've had the chance to talk to that had that kind of moral courage or that was somebody who was hmm. so memorable to you that you knew, you know, this is my calling, this is the right profession for me? Well, I think it's when I've had a chance to be someplace. It's more kind of the location and the time than, than the people. I certainly, I was very interested in, um, in interviewing Bill Russell because mm -hmm. I was a kid outside of Boston when he was playing and when there was such racial strife in Boston during that particular time over desegregation and school busing. Uh, and I thought he was a pretty phenomenal figure. Um, not to stick with the basketball theme, but same thing with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You know, I, I was very, very impressed with him as well. My dad was in the military, but he was a huge Muhammad Ali fan, and he was a believer in Ali's cause when not very many people actually were, not very many white people were anyway, in the 60s. Um, and I saw those two athletes kind of, you know, carrying something forward that was very special in that way. Uh, talk to presidents. I, I think maybe the, the story that changed my life the most would have been in southern Turkey during the first Persian Gulf War. I covered, lived in a tent with the multinational troop, well, not with the troops, I had my own tent, um, <laughs> where the multinational troops were. And we drove our Jeeps across the northern Iraqi border and the Kurds were running for their lives into southern Turkey. And I, I covered Doctors Without Borders and some of the other people who were there who were making a difference under the most difficult possible circumstances. And that was kind of the place where I said, you know what, I'm going to do journalism, but I'm always going to have a foot in that world too, if I can. And I've been fortunate to be able to do that. Has it always been, this is the right calling for me? Or was there ever a time where you thought, this is just so difficult. The times are so challenging. It's time to step back, but you didn't do it. Was there ever, you know, no, I stepped back when I thought I, you know, right after the, the bombing started in Afghanistan post 2001, I went with Mercy Corps on a three month leave of absence and worked along the Afghan Pakistan border. And then I decided, you know what, I'm coming out of a TV career now and I'm going to do nonprofit things and worked with World Vision and, and the Opus Prize and PATH oh, and amazing. Mercy Corps. And I took seven years off doing that, running a small communications company myself, and I'm glad I did. And the only reason I ended up back in TV was because New Day came along. My son was a senior in high school, and I thought, you know, I don't know if I want to freelance out of my empty house, out of my empty nest. So, you know, let me see if I can tackle this and maybe do something positive and have, you know, more complete roots in the community. So I didn't really intend to come back to TV. And then the thought that we might get this show to 10 years was like, you know, who knows if that's going to happen. And now we have, and it just sort of feels to me like, okay, this is a good time to then, you know, head back into the issue world again. Now, for most people, stepping back, but into nonprofits for seven years isn't really <laughs> taking a step back. You oh, always stepped back from television, but I was super right. busy. I traveled a lot. I learned a lot. It was, um, you know, a really, really good thing for me to do. Or, you know, just selfishly, I learned a lot. You have done all of this while being a wife and being a mom. And as you look out to the future that we hope to leave our kids, what are you most hopeful about and what are you most concerned, worried about? Well, easily most concerned about the polarization and the, um, the lack of listening. And I think what we might all describe as a certain just not caring about what other people's experiences are like that strike me as maybe long-term societal issues that will be difficult to knit back together. Economic situations that are going to be difficult to knit back together for kids our kids' ages uh, and lots of other people. But I'm hopeful because 
for example, since um, John Lewis went into the rotunda today, and I was listening to some of the, the young people talk about meeting him and what they got from meeting him and from learning more about his life. And he told us, he told us, don't worry, it's gonna be okay. So I choose to, to keep that in my head. Yeah, he was, he was such a man of the times. And I think too, for young people, someone to aspire to be like in the, in the future. About the future, what are your plans? What are you going, what is your next big thing? <laughs> well, we're moving to North Carolina. I think you know that. We're gonna go live where our son is for a while and sort of do some family time since everybody has to quarantine and whatnot. We thought we'd do that as a family. Reconnect with some East Coast people. Um, there's some political campaigns I'd like to volunteer with and a couple of causes that I wanna be present for. And I figured I'd give that the next six months or so and then, you know, see what comes out of that. But I don't generally have trouble finding things to do. <laughs> so true. I think I'll be okay. <laughs> and then I'm going to backtrack just a bit because I, I would be remiss to not ask you. Over the almost 40 years you've been in this business, you've seen so much change, especially I think for women. Um, what would be some of the, the standout moments or pivotal moments you think for women in this industry? Mm. And do you think well, that we've come as far as we should? Or there's no, some, yeah. no, I don't think so. And I know you don't think so, right? No, no, of course not. Um, obviously there, there have been some steps forward and there've been some amazing people who've done amazing things. But if you look at the number of women, um, not just in newsrooms, but in any sort of management or leading sales or leading stations or being 50-50 represented in rooms where content is decided. Um, we're just not there. I think there was an article the other day in uh, Forbes about the Fortune 500 or whatever, and you know, 37 women out of the 500 top companies are CEOs, and I thought, Somebody said, well, I'm hoping it'll be 250. And I thought, well, how about if it's 500 for as long as it was zero and then we could go to 250. But it's, it's not just women. I think it's everybody coming to the table. We all know that if, if you're not there when those decisions are made about what to cover, who to talk to, who you choose as an expert, um, how you think about the various points of view in a story, then you're not doing your best journalism. So it, it seems pretty clear to me that we need a lot more of um, every sort of constituent from our audience to be represented in newsrooms, including women, of course. And, and simply because I have the opportunity and I always love peeling back your brain on <laughs> in all kinds of issues, but on the issue of race um, in, in the aftermath of George Floyd and so many others, people have, been trying to have all kinds of different conversations around race and equity and how to um, approach even the topic with yeah. colleagues or managers. Um, and I've been reading some interesting literature, how to be an anti-racist, being neutral is actually racist. What are your thoughts on this time that we're in about how to really move forward and navigate to see real change um, post George Floyd? Um, to, to move, not just the conversation, but to create real change? Well, oh gosh, there's so much I think uh, on this, and you and I have talked about this so much. Um, there is a hunger in this country for all people, but I think for marginalized people especially, to wake the rest of the folks up about what it is that we haven't listened to so far, to appreciate those experiences. And to me, at least for Black Lives Matter, we should be able to say that Black Lives Matter, that should not be a tough sell, in my opinion. It means we need to listen more. It, need, it means we need to stand up for our colleagues more, for potential job prospects more, to stand in front of people who might be hurt without our, our participation, but to listen and take leadership, particularly from black women um, at this time. It, it's something I thought about a lot because I my dad was in the service and so the base and school were all integrated and it wasn't until he retired that I lived in a different kind of world and I was really confused about that there's just so much um, right now that makes me want to yell to especially 
um, I'm sorry, just other white people to say, would you last a minute in somebody else's shoes? Why can you not listen? Why can't we change? So that everyone can live in dignity and with respect. I know as a mom, we have boys about the same age, and I think a lot of, about this. I think a lot about the future that we're leaving our kids or what their role is going to be. I was interviewing someone the other day, and it really gave me pause when he said, I, my hope is that my children um, will be active and change makers so that my grandchildren won't have to be. That as far as we've come, we still have so much further to go. Well, we really do, and we really do. But as journalists, I think as women, and especially as moms, we have a role to play. What's the role in your mind? The role is to point to the truth, regardless of the fact that it makes people uncomfortable to hear the truth about ourselves, despite the fact that it may be uncomfortable, to think anew about stuff we think we know, and to educate ourselves. I think you may come to a different conclusion than I might, but let's all be, let's all, be all in on listening to one another and understanding that things you haven't seen, the things you haven't lived, are real, you know, that other people's experiences are real. So at times when we've talked about this subject on the show and I've gotten a response from somebody that, oh, why are you stirring this up? Why is the media bringing this up? As though that's the pro problem, <laughs> you know, right. as though that's the problem instead of recognizing that the problem is this gigantic inequity that we've been fine with for too long. And in my mind, I think, and tell me if you agree, being neutral and on the sidelines is just not an option. That is the problem. People have to be active and be actively an ally if they, if they or we want to see real change. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's really tough because a lot of things that are considered political um, don't strike me as political. They're fact or not fact. They're about morality or decency or equal participation in a, in a system together or about community. Um, so I think we need to get straight on that. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's so hard to cover. I know you're going to start a series on race and I wish I could be doing it with you, but so do I. I, I need to be in the people. listening chair <laughs> and I'm eager to see what you do. Um, we just have to get it out there. We've, we've spent 150 years, and I will say this as somebody um, who's lived in the South a long time, um, I think with a lot of fairy tales about our history, mm -hmm. and it's time that we accept the reality and deal with it. You know, other countries that have had really terrible episodes. I'm thinking about South Africa and Rwanda, whether it was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa or the governmental um, projects that have gone on for 25 years in Rwanda have come to terms. And I feel like with slavery, with Jim Crow, with the school to prison pipeline, with so many things, we've just kind of let it go by and we haven't reckoned. And now we're going to need to reckon. Right. I was remind, reminding my daughter recently that the Housing Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act happened within my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I mean, my lifetime. Her yeah. eyes were like, wow, really? <laughs> and, and so the one thing that I know we cannot lose is hope, because if we don't have hope as parents of, of kids who are going to be here, God willing, after we're gone, uh, if we lose that, then what, what do we have for them, right? We have to hang on to that. And that, I think, Will lead to change. I agree with you. I think the hope is really, you know, there are days <laughs> when you run thin on Seriously. it. But, but yeah, I, I think in the end, 
I, mostly because I see the kids, our kids' age, and I see the difference in the way they approach things. Um, I've been really interested in the polling lately about, you know, changing views about a lot of these issues. And I feel like as bad and as unpleasant and ugly as a lot of things are right now, I just, I literally pray on my knees to God that it takes us to a better place. I'm going to circle back to where I began, Margaret, because um, I know, you know how I feel about you, but so many others have had the gift of having you come into our homes, not just because you're authentically you, but you've always been a true speaker. You've always kept it so real. You've always been so honest with the good news and the bad news, um, but just we have been so very lucky to have you telling us the stories that have impacted our lives. And I feel so blessed to um, call you my friend. And I know you're a friend to many. I know they feel the same way, but to say you're going to be missed just does not, there are not the words to say how much you're going to be missed. You're not just in TV, but here in the Northwest and in the dressing room where I get to talk to you every day. Well, there are, there's still Zoom and phone calls, you know, I'm still at the other end of that. But yeah, I'm definitely going to miss seeing you. And as I've told you before, I mean, we could pack more real stuff into, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes than, than anybody. And I've appreciated your, your counsel and your views and your sharing. And I just think you're at that point where you are joyous and full at this point. You are going to do things from here forward that I think... Um, are just going to be such a light in the world and I'm, I'm dying to see it. Well, you haven't heard the last of me because I'll be calling on you. What do you think about this market? Should I go left or right? <laughs> You've been I'll so be helpful same, throughout probably. my career. I'll be doing the same. We'll be Thank following you, so you. I can't wait to see what you do next. I, just I appreciate can't wait to it. See. Love you. I love you too. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Good luck, Margaret. Thank you. I wish you the best. Thank you.